I want to talk to you about the responsibility that goes with being a Christian. The responsibility that so many are afraid to take up, afraid to face. If you call yourself a Christian tonight, I'm going to tell you there's a responsibility that goes with it. There's a great responsibility. I'm going to tell you something else. There are two kinds of Christians. There's the sensuous Christian. There's the serious Christian. And there are many that are not taking their salvation seriously. They're sensuous. We have people come from all over the United States and around the world to visit New York. Folks, I know who the sensuous preachers are, and I know who the serious preachers are. The sensuous preachers come here with their wives, and the first thing they want to do is go to a Broadway show. They don't want to come to Times Square Church. They don't want to go to a prayer meeting. I would hope that because you're at a prayer meeting tonight, you're one of the serious kind and not the sensuous kind, unless you plan to go out tonight and do something irregular. See, people come to New York City often, and they get into the swing of things. They get into the spirit of this city, and that sensuality comes out. I want to talk about the sensuous and the serious, and I want to talk about the responsibility that goes along with the serious Christian. <clears throat> I'm going to take it from an unusual text. You won't see it at first, but it'll come alive in just a moment. Heavenly Father, I've got to have help. I don't know why you put this in my heart. I don't know who this is for. But God, you're burning it into me, saying, preach it, it's life and death. So, Lord, put the words in my heart. I'm just a vehicle. I'm just a vessel. Speak through this vessel. Sanctify it. Let the word of God come like a sword and with a bottle of oil and transform and save and, and do the work that you have to do, Holy Ghost, through your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Beginning to read verse 1, And Isaac called Jacob, and blessed him, and charged him, and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's, fa thy, thy mother's father. Take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. And Isaac sent away, here's where the message begins, And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Paddan Aram unto Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, and brother Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. When Esau, see we're talking about two kinds of men, two kinds of covenant men. These are men of God, two kinds of men. We're talking about Jacob and Esau. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take a wife from thence, and that he, as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Paddan Aram, Paddan Aram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then when Esau into Ishmael, and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, Nebajoth, to be his wife. You say, what in the world does that have to do with the responsible Christian? Everything. Everything. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about uh, Jacob, for example. Now, Jacob and Esau, let's compare them. These men are, as far as I'm concerned, equally sinful. On the outside, Jacob, his own father, calls him a supplanter, a deceiver. Now, as far as I'm concerned, now the Bible also, in Hebrews, you'll find that he is called a fornicator and a sensuous man. He's sensuous, he's a fornicator, and he has no heart for God. Jacob is a thief, he, he steals, he lies. You see, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I see in the Scripture, both men are equally uh, on the outside, both guilty. They're sinners. They're, they're, they are, they're men of corruption. But see, God sees something in the heart. You find in Malachi, the first chapter, first two verses, it says that and God loved Jacob and hated Esau. But that was because of the foreknowledge of God. God looked down in time and He saw how these men would react to their conditions and he, how their hearts would develop. And I don't believe that these men were condemned from the womb. I don't, I don't believe that at all. I believe God in His foreknowledge saw what was in, his, in their heart. 
If you remember Esau coming in one day, half, uh, very hungry and uh, weary, he'd been hunting and he, he's starving. And Jacob is uh, seething a pot of, of uh, porridge or stew, red stew. And he, he smells it and he comes and he takes a, a place beside that kettle and he says to Jacob, I'm starving. Will you please give me some of your uh, stew? And Jacob says, I will on one condition. You give me your birthright. Give me your birthright. And you remember the story. Esau says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm starving anyhow. What good is it going to do me? So it's a deal. And he sold his birthright. Now, that birthright can be explained in one word, responsibility. Because the firstborn, the firstborn child had the responsibility of setting a standard for the rest of the clan. He had to be different. He had to be shut in with God as Abraham, the first of the clan, as, as their fathers uh, were before, as Isaac is at this present time. He's setting the standard. He's got to walk a different walk and talk differently than the rest. He's got to have wisdom to lead this clan. It wasn't just the, the material blessings that went with that. It was the responsibility. Think of the responsibility of literally hundreds of, of uh, the people, brothers, sisters, their families, the obligation that goes with that, the responsibility of being one worthy of that position. And what he is, this man is already married two Hittite wives, which means he, he is mixed with the world. Now, remember, he's in covenant. He's one of these covenant people with God. And he wants to be under the covering of that covenant. He wants to be known as a man of God. But he, ha he has a fornicating heart. He's got a sensuous heart. And he doesn't want the responsibility that comes with a covenant walk. He doesn't want to be responsible. And that's where many, many Christians are. You see, Jacob was, was so much different. He desired the responsibility. He was not afraid to be made an example before his brethren. He's not afraid, as Paul said, look on me and do as I do. Because he had nothing hidden in his heart. He, he may have had some of these things that God's dealing with in his heart, and God saw that. But he saw something deeper in that. He saw a man who's not afraid to take his position in the covenant. A, con a position that says, all right, if I'm going to walk in covenant with God and expect his blessings, if I'm going to expect to be called a leader, if I'm expected to be called a servant of the living God and lead this clan, I'm not afraid to step out and take my responsibility. If that responsibility means that I have to be fully separated from the world, and that's where Jacob was. He found out that those two Hittite wives of his brother Esau absolutely harassed Rebecca, his mother. She went to Isaac, her husband, and said, These women caused me so much sorrow. They were worldly-minded. They were materialistic. And this is the sensuous Christian. This is the sensuous Christian who doesn't want to take the responsibility for being a child of God, still mixed with the world, a fornicating spirit, can sit and watch all kinds of filthy television, can watch all kinds of, of movies they bring into the house, go anywhere, mix with any crowd, and still want to be called by the name of Jesus. Still want to be called a servant of the living God. But afraid to take responsibility. Husband's afraid to take the responsibility, and therefore a Christian wife has to rise up and take the place of a high priest in the home. Husbands who have secrets in their heart hidden don't want to take the responsibility of being a man of God. They don't want their children to have to look up to them because they know there's something there. And there are many of you who don't want to take responsibility because you don't want to be seen. You want to be hidden because there's something hidden inside. Something that's unlike Jesus, something of this world, and you do not want the responsibility of being set as an example before others. You don't want that responsibility. You go around and say, I don't want to be a hypocrite. And you know what that says? Well, I, I, I'm not living as I should, 
But I, I, there are so many, you know that if, if you really walk close to the Lord, you're going to be an example. People are going to look at you. People are going to expect more out of you. And you don't want that. Because it's going to cost you something. Probably cost you the Hittite walk. It's going to cost you a fornicating spirit. It's going to cost you so many things that you want in this world. It's going to cost you a spirit of materialism and covetousness. You see, Jacob was not afraid of that responsibility. He said, give it to me. This man was not perfect. Esau could have looked at him and said, well, why does he get the blessing? He, he, he's a cheater. Isaac, my father, you know what is in his heart. You yourself call him a surplanter. You call him a cheater. And there are some people don't understand. Some, some, some of these sensuous Christians don't understand. See, Jacob's a serious, Christ, serious type of the serious believer. Still has problems. Yes. But it's a heart for God. A heart that's saying, I will step out. I'll be that example for God. Whatever the cost. I may slip. I may make a mess of it, but I'm going to have my face set. There's something in the heart that's reaching out to God all the time. And that's why God sends the latter and angels and the message of the heart of God. Folks, I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit on His Word tonight because He's speaking to people who've been living double lives just like this man. Jacob is told by his mother and then his father, his father knowing what's in him, yet he knows that he's going to obey. And that's what, that's the sign of a serious Christian who takes the things of God seriously. I am so sick and tired of seeing people in the house of God who walk 10 years, 15 years with Jesus, so called. They've never been serious about God. They really don't read their Bibles. They don't pray. They're not serious about God. They've never been serious about God since they were so-called saved. They're not serious about the Lord. They've been drifting. They've been playing the Christian game. There's no responsibility in their life. There's no example. There's no obedience from the heart. Oh, there's occasional obedience, but it's a surface obedience. It's just works of the flesh. And you'll see that here in just a moment with Esau. But he, he, he could say to his father, look at Jake, he's no better than I am. I may be a fornicator, I may, I may be mixed up with the world, and I've got Hittite wives, and they, they serve idols, and they don't know Jehovah, and I'm mixed up with the crowd. Yes, but I'm not a cheater like him. And you, you see the, the sensuous Christians see the blessing of God on somebody that they think is no better than themselves and can't understand it. They're being blessed. How are they being blessed? And I'm in sorrow. I'm in pain. I, I'm not enjoying the blessing of God. Because you can't enjoy the blessing of God when you're not serious about Him. God's never going to take sin out of anybody's life. He's not going to heal anybody. He's never going to hear from them again. If God knows he, you're going to walk away from him and not hear you, why should he, why should he heal? Why should he take away the power of sin? Why should he do anything that's just going to hasten your walk away from him? You're, you're just going to neglect him. The Lord would just as soon keep you in your struggle and in your turmoil where there's a chance you still turn to him. Did you hear what I said? Why should God do anything with anybody just that he's not going to hear from him anymore? They're not going to pray, they're not going to seek his face, and he knows that. Esau hears that Isaac has commanded Jacob. He said, look, I don't want you marrying Canaanite women. I don't want you mixed with the world. I want you to stay pure. I want you to keep the clan the bloodline. I want a pure seed is what he's talking about. I want a pure seed. You and I are the seed of Christ. And that's why he's been giving us the commandments so the seed may be kept pure. And he, he said, go to Padam Aram and find a wife of our kind, our clan. And he knew Jacob would obey. And Jacob obeys. Immediately he heads out to Padam Aram. 
to find a wife of his own clan, of his own kind. And Esau hears this. And let me pick it up here now. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob, you see, when you walk in obedience, you're going to be blessed. You, you may not have, see, he doesn't have any material blessings. Now, the man, the man is really homeless and he has nothing but a bag knapsack on his back. And he doesn't even know what his future is going to be. But he's got confidence in God. And he's got the blessing of God with him. Folks, you've got the blessing of God. You have everything. And so he, he heads out. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge or a commandment, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Paddan Aram. He said, well, well, no, wait a minute. I may have lost the blessing. I may have lost the birthright. But I see how it works. You just obey and you get the blessings. Just obey. But folks, God doesn't accept obedience unless it comes from a heart that's wholly given to him. He's not going to take obedience that's just for show. You, we've got people, Sunday churches everywhere in this country are packed. You can't get a seat in almost any. The deadest, ungodliest church in America is going to be full tomorrow on Sunday. Because it's time for Esau to do his thing. Christians go to church, they get blessed, they'll go to church. Eastern Christmas. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased, not Isaac his father, in other words, his own Hittite Canaanite wives, and then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he, uh, unto the wives which he had. He already had two wives. And he took Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. He said, well, the Canaanite women displease my father. So I'm not going to marry a Canaanite woman. I'm going to get one of our own kind also. So he goes and marries, takes to wife Mahalath. And you know what her name means in Hebrew? Grief, sorrow, and disease. And when you don't deal with the sensuality, the spirit of sensuality, when you live the double life, and then suddenly you say, look, I want, I want God. I want his blessing. I'm no hypocrite. I'm a believer. I'm going to obey God. So you set out to do it on your own strength. He's not obeying from the heart because when, when you go to, to Genesis 36, you'll find in verse 1 and 2, Verse uh, chapter 36, that he marries off his own sons to Canaanite women. Look, look, chapter 36, it's, it's incredible. This is what was in his heart. Chapter 36, verse 1, 2. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. And Esau took of his wives of the daughters of Canaan. Took his wives of the daughters of Canaan. Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And, and I'm not even going to name them. I can't even name all these. I haven't had time to look for the pronunciations of them. And then he marries off all his sons to Canaanite women. So you see, the world was still in him. He'd never laid down his life for Jesus. He'd never become serious about the things of God. He didn't want to take on the responsibility. And yet he wanted to obey. So in one area of his life, in one little area of his life, he's going to obey and he's going to go to his father. He's going to bring this bride. I can just see him bring him, bringing his, his bride to his mother, Rebecca. And Rebecca just shaking her head. 
She knows that he hasn't changed in his heart. He's the same man. He goes into his father Isaac's tent to introduce his new wife, thinking now he'll get a blessing from God. All he got was sorrow, grief, and disease. It appears the woman was named after her frailty. I believe that wife caused him nothing. She was in bed all the time. She was full of disease. She caused him grief. She henpecked him. Because that's her name. What do you get when you come to the Lord to obey with a half heart? Still neglecting His Word. Still afraid to take the responsibility of being a man or woman of God and everything that it, that it entails. Walking by faith. Separating yourself from the world. Coming out from among them and being separate and clean, saith the Lord. Then I receive you as my son or my daughter. I'm telling you, you can't do that in your own strength. You have to do that through the power of the Holy Ghost. But that power of the Holy Ghost does not, is not given promiscuously. The Holy Ghost doesn't throw out His blessings promiscuously. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. He is looking at your heart tonight. Would you go to Malachi? And then I'm going to close. First chapter. Last book in the Old Testament. I'm going to read just the first few verses. Malachi, first chapter. The burden of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I've loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob. And I hated Esau. Folks, look at me, please. You have no idea. We have no idea how God hates half-heartedness, lukewarmness. He said, I'll spew that thing out of my mouth. We have no, I, we have no concept of God hates those who neglect Him, who, who are afraid to take the responsibility that goes with bearing His name. And look what happens. I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. The dragons are, are the beast inside. Those, those lusts, those cravings, those, those leanings toward the world. Whereas Edom, Edom is Esau. In other words, because after he got his porridge, remember, God called him Edom. That's Esau saith, we are impoverished. We will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw it down. They shall call them the border of wickedness, the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Folks, I'm going to close right there. Look this way, if you will, please. Just give me a few moments. I've, I've had my 20 minutes. <clears throat> I've been mandated by the Holy Ghost tonight. I didn't have a word of this an hour ago. Except... The thought the Holy Spirit had planted. He spoke to you extemporaneously. Because the Holy Ghost revealed to me that there were people in this meeting tonight. Unless this word came cutting and lovingly to your spirit. You will never, ever. The Lord says, my anger will be against this kind of spirit forever. You'll be impoverished in your spirit. He said, you'll try to build. I'll tear it down. You'll try to build up some kind of a work system to please God. God said, I'll tear all your works down. You'll be impoverished. You'll try everything to get the blessing and you'll not be able to get it. You'll run to meeting after meeting. You'll go place after place. And that's why many Christians are running all over the world trying to find a revival or a word or somebody to knock them down. I'm not saying that's true of everybody. Many, are, many of them are godly, hungry, searching people. But many now, in these last days, folks, if, you've never, if you didn't think our society was spinning out of control up to this week, then you should surely see it now. 39 people. 
commit suicide, hoping to be picked up by a spaceship with five dollars and quarters in their pocket and a suitcase packed? What in the world would you need with quarters on a spaceship going to some far off planet? Quarters. I'm not making fun, but this, the, 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 the craziness, the blindness, five dollar bill, a new crisp five dollar bill, and four quarters and some change, a little suitcase. And they're going to be picked up this week, they said. By a spaceship trailing the new Haley Comet. You say, how could it happen to anybody with half a mind? I'm going to tell you what I think. I think it'd probably be more mercy on those kind. And those who knew the way and turned aside. <clears throat> Bible said, better you never knew, better you never heard. I never try to scare people into the kingdom of God, because as soon as scare is gone, you're gone. But if I ever in my lifetime preach the heart of God, I preached it to you now. And up in the balcony in the main floor. I'm not asking to come down here and wail and scream. I'm asking you to get honest with God. Let's examine yourself for just a minute before I close. Last 30 days, how often have you neglected this? How much of this have you really absorbed to find Jesus? How much have you loved Him? How serious have you been about the Word of God and living a victorious life to go to the Word to find the answer on how to do it? Let me ask you another question. Last 30 days. How many hours or half hours or quarter hours have you spent shut in with God, TV off, radio off, all your friends, family, everybody, and you're alone with Jesus, and you're letting the Holy Ghost examine you to see if you're in the faith, and you are saying, I'm hungry for you, Jesus. I know you're coming soon, and I want to be a, uh, I want to be a part of your bride, and I want to learn to love you. I don't know how. I'm weak, but I'm coming to you like Jacob, a surplanter, a cheat. But I'm serious about you, Lord. I have a heart that's serious. I want to know you. Have you done that? Or, or is it said of you, my children neglected me days without number? Are you that sensuous Esau that God hates, that spirit that God hates? Stand. Holy Ghost, you hit me with this like thunder. You hit it in my soul so strong. Lord, I plead with those who call themselves by your name that are here now that have not gotten serious about their walk not willing to take up the responsibility of separating and saying, Oh God, I will come out from among them. I will lay down the spirit of this world. Lord, there's been too much of the world in me. I, I, the pull of the world has been too strong. Oh God, I don't want an Esau spirit. God, I want to walk in covenant with you. Holy Spirit, send genuine conviction. The kind Lord that will bring forth the grace and the mercy of God. Hallelujah. Lord, I believe there are many that need to walk down this aisle and strip themselves of their pride. Doesn't matter what people think they were. It's what they know they are to be. They know what they are. Lord, we all know what we are. Holy Ghost, I ask you to come tonight. Come to this prayer meeting and change lives. God, there was a reason for everyone being here tonight and a reason for the word that was being preached. Oh, Holy Ghost, come now with your fire. God, come down and transform lives by your grace and mercy, I pray. You hear God speaking? Come on. No songs, no pleading. You come as the Spirit of God draws you. Hallelujah. Up in the balcony, go to the stairs either side and come down and we'll pray. 
God set you free tonight. Hallelujah. Don't come unless the Spirit draws you. You'll know it because there'll be a stirring inside. It's like a knife. It's the Holy Spirit in love saying, this was for you. Obey. Obey Him. Please move in close. Hallelujah. It's so beautiful to watch the Holy Spirit work. What a beautiful sight to see the Holy Ghost just breathe. And He speaks in love and said, Now, it sounds like a hard word, but you had to hear it. God says, I have to break through that veil. And He comes with His sword of His Word, and He cuts the veil. The only reason He brings the sword and cuts the veil is so that you can see right. So that you can break in again to the Holy of Holies. Just listen as the Spirit continues and finishes His work. The good work He's begun, He's going to finish in your heart. It is said of Esau, listen closely, He found no place of repentance. He sought it with tears, but He found no place. Now, folks, it wasn't because... The grace of God didn't abound. The grace of God is just as clear in the Old Testament as it is in the New. But he couldn't find it because he did not repent with his heart. You can cry tears. You can say prayers. You, you can say the sinner's prayer. You can say, I come to you, Jesus. But unless your heart, you're willing to lay your heart down and let him take all of your heart. He came only in tears. He sought repentance. But it was not repentance with the heart. With the heart, man believes. With the heart. Look, folks, everything I talk about is your heart. I want a heart. If you're here tonight to say, I want a heart that's in love with Jesus. I want a heart that gets to know Him. If, if you do that, if you say, Jesus, I want to get close to you. I want to know you. And once you do that, He'll tell you how to live for Him. He'll give you the Word. He'll speak to you that direction and how to live an overcoming life. You won't need a book of how-to sermons. You won't need tapes. You won't even need a preacher. The Holy Ghost will teach you. He'll put His law in your heart. Now, all I'm going to do is suggest a prayer to you, and then I'm going to ask you to expand on it. Because the Bible said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I want you to just shut yourself in for a moment and, and cry out to Jesus with this simple prayer. And then I'm going to ask you to pray in your own words. But I'm just, ho hopefully you'll focus on this. My words won't save you. Just, just repeating after me is not going to change you. But it will if it comes from your heart and you're willing to say, Jesus, I, I repent. I'm coming to repent tonight. I'm repenting of neglect. I'm repenting of a lack of willingness to take on responsibility of being what I claim to be, a child of God. Pray this with me. Jesus, I've neglected you. I've neglected your word. I've neglected prayer. I've neglected my love for you. I've left my first love. And I'm sorry. And I repent. And I come to you now to give you my heart. And I ask you, Jesus, by the power of the Holy Ghost, draw me to yourself. Set me free from my bondage. Break the sensuousness in me. Break the pride in me. Jesus, help me to come out of the world and the things of this world and set my affection on you and the things above and not on this earth. Now, in your own words, just lift up your hands and talk to Jesus, man to man, woman to, to Christ, heart to heart, just a heart to heart talk right now. Folks, let's all, everybody in this building, let's talk to Jesus right now and say, Lord, draw me to yourself. Reveal yourself to me. Father, let there be a revelation to these that are standing here tonight. That will not just be an emotional thing, but the Spirit of the living God will go deep into the heart. Break hearts, transform lives by the Spirit of God. Let the Spirit of the living God come forth, transforming by faith.
the mercy and the grace of God. Hallelujah. Now, will you pray this prayer with me? Holy Spirit, you alone have the power. I don't have the power. I can't break my habits. I can't overcome sin. But my Bible says, by the power of the Holy Spirit, all the deeds of the flesh are killed and mortified by faith in the power of the Holy Ghost. Oh God, you have the power to deliver me and set me free and keep me free. <laughs> now thank him for that. Just thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Look this way, please. How many of you have never been at this altar before? Raise your hand, please. The first time you've been up here at the front, lift it high now. I'm not counting numbers. Just want to see where are you from? Staten Island? Huh? Queens? Where are you from? Where are you from, sir? Brooklyn? Where are you from? Yes. Hmm? Japan, okay. And where are you from? Pittsburgh. Portland, Maine. Connecticut. What? Where? Okay. Yes, God bless you. You see, it doesn't matter where you're from. Same, same problems, same needs, same Christ, same deliverance. Hallelujah. One more. Now, folks, one of the most important parts of the service, we're going to prayer in just a moment. I'm going to let all of you that are in front go back to your seats, and then we're going to pray. We're going to start with Israel. And, and if, if you have a heart for Jesus, now, I'm not saying that if you have to go, you don't have a heart for Jesus. Don't get me wrong. Some of you I know have to go. That's okay. But those who want to stay with us and pray, we're going to pray now. We're going to spend the next half hour praying, seeking God. This is the conclusion of the message.
We'll be right back.